as uh, Ria said, it's already Christmas. As I think it was mentioned earlier, it's December too. You wonder where all these months have gone by. Uh, where did the days go? It's already December too. Christmas is fast approaching. And I remember when my wife and our youngest son one time, they were in the mall shopping, uh, buying gifts. My son started to blurt out, Santa is the king of Christmas. All right. And so uh, Jen started to, quiet, quiet, quiet. We might see some church members. They might not, you know, <laughs> they might think we're not teaching our kids properly. Okay. But, um, but you know what? When you look at the malls, when you look at the decorations, it's kind of blurry what, the, what Christmas is all about. Um, and you will not blame a child for thinking that way. Um, and I think about how we've taken, Christmas has taken on a lot of different meanings. We've redefined Christmas. We have uh, given a lot of different uh, attachments to it, maybe due to commercialization or secularism. Uh, and the core and the essence of the season has been covered up, and which is why our, our series is entitled Rediscovering Christmas. What we want to look at are the different perspectives of the New Testament writers and talking about the important message of incarnation, the doctrine of incarnation and how that is so important in all of human history that God did not just come, but he became like one of us. Not just about his coming, but his becoming to be one of us. Now, years ago, a couple of decades ago, I don't know if you would remember, those of you who are um, older enough, all right, that uh, there was a wave of, uh, I guess, shawarma stalls that went on. Uh, this was during the 90s. Anybody here remember that like, every street corner, there was a shawarma stall, right? And as soon as you know, it hit like a storm, us, uh, like the way pearl shakes of Zagu and Quickly, hit the nation but as fast uh, as, uh, as, as it stormed in it also quickly faded like you know the morning mist when the sun rises and so but in the recent times there's been a resurgence via Turks and Shawarma Brothers and Shawarma Shack okay, I'm not sponsored by any means uh, but uh, it's just the rediscovering of the Shawarma right and so I wanted to talk about Today, specifically, as we look at the different scriptures, we'll talk about Matthew today. Next week, we'll talk about Luke's perspective. Week after that, John's perspective. The different gospel writers and New Testament writers. And hopefully uncover, recover, and discover, rediscover the essence of Christmas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the series that we're going to start today. Thank you that you will realign us. You will recalibrate the, us the way we view and see and look and even celebrate Christmas. I pray, Lord, that you would keep our eyes focused and our hearts directed towards the word. We know, Lord, that there can be many distractions from our phones, from our thoughts to uh, Christmas parties and all that. But Lord, I pray in the next several minutes that you would allow us to just focus in and lay aside every distraction to hear from you in jesus name we pray amen matthew chapter 1 18 to 25 is our text today matthew was the one who wrote the book of matthew who was a tax collector rescued saved and delivered by jesus when he was serving the roman government who was considered, he was considered a traitor by the people of Israel. Um, he, when he got saved, he started talking and preaching and wrote in his gospel book about the king and his kingdom. And if you would notice, the theme of his whole book is about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the king who will usher in the kingdom of God as he has come to rule. This was written, this book was written in the 60s or 70s, not 1960s or 1970s, but the 60s and the 70s, 70 AD. Uh, the scholars are not quite sure, could not pinpoint exactly when, but at least in that era or that decade, 60s and 70s. And so uh, uh, Matthew was, it was still fresh for him because about three de decades prior was when Jesus resurrected from the dead. 
And that is a marker or something in your brain that will not be erased. Somebody dying and somebody getting raised from the dead. You will never forget that experience, right? I mean, so he started writing the book uh, because it was the eyewitnesses during the time of Matthew were starting to die because of persecution, because of old age. And so, but, but so that people will not forget what Jesus did, so that people will not forget what happened during those times, the life of Christ, he started writing it down. He started, uh, he wrote the book. So it was, as I said, about three decades prior. How many of you know three decades is not very long? I mean, especially for a major event, you will never forget. I guess kind of like uh, Coach Eric Altamiran who goes to this church. Now, three decades ago, they won their first UAAP championship in UP, right? And so, although they lost yesterday, I know. But, uh, um, yeah, that's, and Joey Guanyo actually goes to the 8 a.m. service, right? So, and so, and, and so if, if Eric would write a book talking about their championship 32 years ago, that would still be fresh, okay? And so that was kind of like what Matthew was going through. It's hard to forget. A championship is hard to forget, much less somebody getting raised from the dead, right? And so Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. I read the first verse, at least for our text today, and I had to stop at the word now. Everybody say now. now. Reason for this is because after 400 years of silence, after the Maccabean revolt, if you would read the intertestamental years of the Old Testament and the New Testament, after 400 years of silence, God speaks, now God comes. Now God speaks, now God does something in human history that is unprecedented. Now He comes. 400 years He seemed silent. But what seemed to be silence, God was at work in the background. Behind the scenes, he was doing something. I wonder if that's the same thing with your life and mine sometimes. That what God, or at least God's silence, actually does not mean he's not doing anything. He's actually working behind the scenes. And that was what goes going on because Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, had to be established. Before that, there were barbarians and there were people who would just invade cities and nations. But the, all over the Roman Empire, there was just peace. So you, will, you can go and travel all around because there was peace. Not only was there peace, Roman peace, but the Roman roads, the infrastructure of the roads made the people or allowed the people to travel from place to place uh, easier. Not only the Roman roads, but also Greek language, the Koine Greek, became the universal language at that time, which was the new, where the New Testament was written, in Greek. And so all this was set up. God was setting up the stage for the coming of this historic event of all of human history. Now God comes in and steps in the picture. This was during the oppression where, where the Roman... Uh, empire was oppressing the Israelites. Jesus intervenes in the midst of the darkest moments. How many of you know God can step in anytime? In the darkest moments, God steps in and he redeems. That's the picture of who your God, our God is. Verse 18, he says, continuing on, he had been betrothed to Joseph. All right, betrothal is in between engagement and wedding. More than engaged, not quite married yet, right? And so uh, uh, there were two words that were used. There were two stages in a Jewish wedding. There was the kiddushin and the chupa, okay? You have to use it, chupa, all right? It's like there's something stuck there, right? Chupa, right? And so these two stages, the first stage is the betrothal stage. The second stage would be the wedding and so the first stage where the families would come together, write up a contract and say, all right, my daughter is getting married with your son. It's, it's kind of like an arranged situation, 
right? And so, interestingly enough, our tour guide in Israel said, the arranged marriages in Israel lasts longer than romantic marriages. Because couples come in with a decision to love for better or for worse. It wasn't because of emotion, but because of decision. Which after coming from that trip, I told my daughter, I said, okay, we're going to do it the Jewish way. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to find somebody for you. Okay. Of course, she did not like that. Now, um, betrothed to Joseph. Verse 19. And her husband... Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Again, as I said, because betrothal had a contract, to break off that engagement or betrothal, there had to be a divorce. So that was the situation here. And notice that he was called the husband. They're not yet married, but he's already considered the husband. Okay, that's what was going on here. Because, you know, sometimes when you read the scriptures, you just read and, and, you know, flippantly, nonchalantly read through and then not realizing there's a lot of stuff going on behind it. And so this was what was going on. Joseph was unwilling to put her to shame. Now, understand that the Jewish culture was more Asian than Western. And it was a, an honor-shame society where a person will, may lose face and there's embarrassment. It, again, there's bring shame to the family. It's very Asian, as I said. And so to Joseph, it was a pot potentially embarrassing situation. Why? Because to Joseph, he would have been duped, cheated, and deceived. I mean, the explanation to him by Mary was, God did it. <laughs> now, how convenient, right? God did it. Like, what do you mean God did it? Right? How do you explain this? To Mary, same thing. Embarrassing situation. Brought sh may bring shame to the family. How do I explain this to people? Right? How do I... Uh, no one will believe me because I would be considered as disloyal and unfaithful. They'll think I had a fling with somebody. Again, these are the things... Sometimes we read and it's, it's so sanitized in Scripture, isn't it? But we don't realize this was what was going on. But here's a thought for you. To the person who obeys God, sometimes it will be hard to explain what God is doing to the people. If you honor God, if you obey God, sometimes people will not understand why you made the decision you made. That's just life why you made that decision to start the business, why you broke off that relationship with this person that was dishonoring to the Lord, why you, some of the stuff that you will decide on, it will not make sense to people, but it will make perfect sense to God. Verse 20, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Who's he? That's Joseph. He was considering what? Divorce. He was, he was considering to break off quietly, nicely, kindly, but he was still going to break off. You know, I guess you can sing that song. Uh, what's that song by James Ingram? Uh, something about breaking somebody's heart. How do you break somebody's heart, right? There's no easy way to break somebody's heart, okay? Um, but anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but God sees our inner thoughts. God sees our inner thoughts. Even before we make a decision or we, even before we do them, God already knows our thoughts. Okay, whatever decision. Now, I don't know if anybody here has ever been, been ever thankful for God intervening before we've ever made that foolish decision. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Like, you know, I'm so glad I did not make that decision. That God threw in a monkey wrench and that cost me to what? Push, pull back from that decision. Or I'm so glad I didn't marry that fiance of mine, my ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend. I, I don't know I, where I would be today if, if th that guy was with me today, right? Or if I started that business, good thing, what seemed to be a disappointment was actually God's appointment. 
it seemed like it was a frustrating season in my life, but God intervened and he saved me from disaster. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Well, probably it won't, maybe it'll be in heaven that we'll recount all these things. I'm so glad God saved me and intervened. So as he considered these things, an angel of the Lord stepped in and stopped him. And then he says, okay, the wife that you have, fear not, take her as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we're clueless, aren't we, regarding what God is doing behind the scenes. But here's the thing. Anything that is new and uncertain will always incite fear. Always. Because you're uncertain. You don't know what's up ahead. That's the number one, or at least the top five, if you look at the top uh, ten lists online, of fears of people. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the uncertain. And every time your security is, you know, is, 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 uh, is threatened, right? Then fear will step in. That's what happens. That's why God had to tell Joseph, do not fear. Take her as your wife. Some people here today need to hear that. Do not fear. Just take that in for a moment. Do not fear. Verse 21. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the word Jesus or Jesus is the Greek name of the Aramaic version of that name, uh, Yeshua. Yeshua. Okay? So Greek, Jesus, Yeshua would be the Aramaic. means to deliver, to rescue, to save. That's the purpose and that's the destiny of this uh, baby that was to be born. Okay? And... and do you know the, name, the, the meaning of your names? I hope you know the meaning of your names, right? Because especially if you're going to be a parent in the future, know the meaning of, of your child's name because there's reason and there's destiny and there's purpose in that name, right? Verse 22, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. See what God says, God does to fulfill what was spoken. Verse 23, all right. Let me, let me point this out to you. The stuff that God does, we don't understand. But is it possible that you, everything that you're going through today is preparing you for what you've actually prayed for? The stuff, the challenges, maybe even the frustration, maybe even the uncertainty and the fear, all that, all the stuff that happened this year, you've actually asked the Lord for, 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 for something in the future. And maybe God's preparing you. Right? But all the uncertainty fears, we can, we can offer that to the Lord and submit it to the Lord because God works behind the scenes. Now, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Here, the angel confirms. Actually, it vindicates Mary. Okay? Why? Because to the public... She's still a virgin. She has not had any relationship with any other man. And to Joseph, it confirms she did not have a fling. She did not have another relationship. She did not have another boyfriend, right? Um, so reason being, because during those days, and you'll read this in the history books, there were people who were accusing Jesus as illegitimate child, as maybe... Uh, Mary has had a relationship with a Roman soldier which made her an adulteress. And so all this were going on. So the gospel writer Matthew had to make it clear she was a virgin when she conceived Jesus. Again, there's a lot of things going on in the background if we don't understand the context, right? And so she was not being disloyal. She was not uh, being unfaithful. Now, verse 23, moving on, it says, Name him, you have, you have to call him, uh, his title will be Emmanuel, God with us. I don't know if you've ever wondered why some are letter I or some letter E, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel is the Hebrew version. E, uh, with the letter E would be the Greek version, 
That's why they're different, okay? And let me unpack for you this title and this name of Jesus, God with us, okay? Emmanuel means with us. El is the word for God. Emmanuel, God with us. When you talk about God being with us, it speaks about his divinity. How many of you know anyone can actually claim divinity today? I'm the son of God. But you can only claim this if you rise from the dead. And so only Jesus has the ability to claim this because he is rising from the dead or he rose from the dead. And to say that Jesus is divine is actually an offensive claim. I'll explain this in a bit. It's been offensive then, still is offensive now. If you remember those days, there were Greek and um, Roman mythologies, Zeus and all, uh, Artemis and all of the different gra- uh, Greek gods and goddesses, right? And so they had gods coming down from the heavens, going to earth, and doing a lot of things I cannot mention on a Sunday afternoon in church, all right? And so do a lot of crazy things. And that's why you'll have demigods. That's why you have Wonder Woman today, okay? Or all those characters in Percy Jackson, right? And so you have demigods. And, and so, but that's not what, so there were, there were stuff that was going on. These were the stories during those days. But Matthew was pointing out this story, not as a copy of those, but he was saying the only God has come from heaven, the God of, who created heavens and the earth, the God who, um, who split open the Red Sea, the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To say that, is an offensive claim because God said there is no other God besides me. Which means all the other gods are idols. Marduk, Molech, Baal, Ashtoreth, all the other gods. Every other god out there is an idol. All other claimants were idols and false. They were just counterfeits. All other claimants were idols, mere products of history and culture that will only live in the minds of those that produce them. That was the claim. Offensive then and offensive still until today. Why? Because this God, the only God who came to planet Earth through the in a person of Jesus Christ, God made flesh. That's what incarnation is, carne, okay, Uh, flesh, okay, incarnation, God made flesh, dwelt among us, became like one of us, and if he is God, no one else is, okay, and he claims to have risen from the dead, and he claims he is the only way, the truth, and the life, no one goes to the Father except through him. That's why his brothers didn't believe him. Remember James, who wrote the book of James, and Jude? They're actually brothers of Jesus. All right? Jesus was the firstborn, but the rest were with Joseph and Mary. All right? And so this is central to the Christian faith, and it's offensive because Jesus claims he's the only way, the truth, and the life. All right? Now, God and God with us. He's not just transcendent and far away, but he's also imminent, meaning close, and he's near us, that he's a relational God. You see, Matthew started with God with us in Matthew chapter 1 and ends in Matthew 28 with Jesus declaring, I will be with you till the end of the age. That's what, Jesus, uh, that's what Matthew did. Okay? This was a time during intense persecution. He was trying to encourage the early church. Why? Because people were being thrown into the lion's den. People were being thrown into the fire. They were being burned at the stake. They were being thrown into hot boiling oil, alive. These were the things that they were going through, okay? And they would meet secretly in caves to worship God, okay? But this statement, Emmanuel, God with us, 
was an encouragement to the church. Because God's presence brings assurance in the midst of trying circumstances. This, these were persecuting or persecution, uh, times of persecution. Their question, all right, I told you they would meet in caves. Their question was not, will my friends be in church today? Will I get to fellowship with them? That wasn't the question. Their question was, will I get to church and come back alive? I've been in one of those caves in Israel where they would meet. It's a small, dark, dungeon cave, right? And so the question was not, will my friends there so we can fellowship and have fun together? Question was not, will the worship music be uplifting? Will it be a full band? Question was not, will the worship leader have color-coordinated co clothing? Or will she have really nice voice today? Or will the preacher preach well today? That's not the question that they were asking. They would come together and worship Jesus. They would come together and listen to the word of God. The question is, was not, will I have a nice parking spot today? <laughs> or will I have to go to the shuttle there in uptown and then have to go shuttle here? That wasn't the question. We're so spoiled today. I'm not mad, I'm just passionate. <laughs> will the live stream work today or will it be lagging because of internet? That wasn't the question. Will I be able to sit in my favorite area in church? So it wasn't the question. You know, there was a book I read years ago. It's called uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. No? There was intense persecution going on. I remember one of the... One of the church fathers said it this way. He said, the, the, the blood of the martyrs have become the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs have become the seed of the church. When there's persecution, the, the church grows. That's what we see in every nation China now. Our church there is growing because of persecution. Imagine inviting people to church today and saying, uh, okay, where do I park? Oh no, we're meeting in a cave today. There's, there's no parking there. Where do I sit? On a rock? Or maybe on the floor, on the ground, on the soil. Okay. Will there be aircon? Will it be warm, cold? None of those. Will I see the PowerPoint presentation on an LED screen, Pastor? That wasn't the question. Question. Are you ready to be associated with this offense? Because this claim is offensive. Jesus being God, Jesus being a nice, good, moral teacher sounds more acceptable and palatable today. He's somebody you can quote on Twitter. Acceptable, right? But to declare that he is God and he alone is the way, the truth, and the life, you will sound so narrow, you will sound so intolerant and arrogant maybe even called a bigot. Are you ready for that? We can't be naive and present the gospel as innocuous placebo that is acceptable to everyone. God with us. Finally, let's wrap it up. He's transcendent and exceptional. A same breath, he's imminent and relational but he has come to be with us. With us, with you and me, All right? He didn't, Matthew didn't say God with you or God with me. He said with us because God was creating and building a spiritual family, a spiritual community called the church. That's you and I. And at, at the beginning of the early, uh, early part of the church, there was a lot of intense persecution and they had to come together to encourage one another in their faith. Because they don't know the next day if they're still going to be alive. That's the situation then. God has come for a community of believers, a kingdom community, and a spiritual family. You see, Jesus has come so that he can save us and that we would come together and build a community of believers. See, my destiny cannot be fulfilled apart from the people I am walking with. I cannot fulfill my destiny apart from Pastor Emil. I cannot fulfill my destiny apart from 
Lowell, or he cannot fulfill his destiny apart from or in purpose from the spirit, the family of God. Yours as well. If you think you can live on your own, that's you are gravely mistaken. We can only fulfill our purpose and destiny if we are in a community. See, Brad Pitt's eyes are beautiful, but if it's in a glass container, it's gross. If you're not part of a community and you're just rolling, to use that metaphor, you're gross. Or at least you're disconnected at the very least. And that's why we talk about small group a lot. Being in a community. And I know traffic is bad. We already know that. But what's traffic compared to being thrown in the lion's den? Traffic is bad, I'm sure. Okay? And we all have to work and we're tired and, and we meet together in small groups. But listen... God has called us to live in community. If you think you could live on your own, you're gravely mistaken, as I said. That's why the call to discipleship is a cost. There is a cost to the call of discipleship. But God said, God is with us, Emmanuel. Verse 24. Let me try to wrap it up. When Joseph woke from, a sli from the sleep, from his sleep, he did as the angels, angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. What did the angel tell him? Name him Jesus. He's Emmanuel. He will save his people from... There's, that's not, there's not a lot of information there. Sure, he will save. It's a general purpose. He will save his people from his sins, their sins. But there were other questions. I'm sure in the mind of Joseph, what will I do next? How will I tell his, her parents? What will I do? Where will we live? What, what, how will I take care of this, this child? I'm sure he had a lot of questions. What will I put in the birth certificate, born of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> what will I say? He, I'm sure he had a lot of questions, but you know what? Sometimes it's not a reason that we need, but a revelation. That you need a revelation. We need a revelation that God is with us. Whatever the, the, the 2019 holds for us, that's all right. Bring it on. God is with us. It doesn't matter what the news say, but God is with us. That's what you need to embrace and hold on to. It's not a reason, but a revelation. The revelation has a purpose. The revelation that God has a purpose and uh, God is in control. The revelation that God has your life in his hands. The revelation that says God has a plan. You think you have a better plan? He's lived longer than you. We think we have a better idea of what needs to happen in 2019. He has been at this for quite some time. Talking about having a plan. We've lived what? 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. He's lived longer than that. 23, 25. But he knew her not until she'd given birth to a son. Now, the word knew is the word ginosko in, in Greek, and it's not, it's not the know as in, yeah, okay, I know her. Yeah, she's a, an acquaintance, she's a friend. No, in a personal kind of relationship as in physical relationship with a man and a woman. Knew her not. As I said, um, they had children after Jesus. Okay, but until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Let me bring some application as we end. Number one, because God is with us, we can trust his power. God is with us, we can trust his power. He has the ability to fulfill his promise. He's done that over and over and over and over again. He said, I'm going to send a Messiah. He did it. He said he will come again. You think he's going to do it? Yes, he will. He says he's going to provide for you. You think he's going to provide for you? Of course he will. He says he's going to bring healing. You think he will? Yes, he will. You think he's going to save your family 
Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household? Yes, He will. You can trust His power because God is with us. Number two, because God is with us, we can be confident of His presence. You can face life head on. Persecution, difficulty, trial, you know God is with us. It's not a reason, but a revelation that we need. Number three, because God is with us, then we can live life out with spiritual family. Live life out with spiritual family. You know, there's a lot of things in life that's dangerous to do on your own. Don't scuba dive alone. Okay? If you're a police officer, don't go out on a duty on your own. You know what's more dangerous? Living out, living out this Christian life alone. You can't connect with somebody find somebody look for people who can walk with you pastor joel and jenny were here this morning at the 10 o'clock service and i was i was just telling them we're, my wife and i are just grateful we get to walk and live out this christian life with people like them who has helped us in our marriage who has helped us in our parenting pastor joey and marie to this day i viber him and i call him when i need help i'm just glad i get to walk with people who love God perfect by no means loves God yes some of you you've been in a small group you've been offended that's fine they're people they're imperfect people just like who just like you but don't give up on relationships walk with people journey with people don't let go. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Just allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Um, there's a lot that's been said today. Sometimes we're quick to move on to the next activity. Not enough time for meditation and reflection. Lord, speak to us. Some of you here today, God's calling you home. The same he called same way he called Matthew. He was in his sin. He was in a life that is far away from God. And God called him and delivered him and saved him and rescued him. Embraced the life that Jesus was offering him. Received the forgiveness of his sin. Some of you need to make that decision today. Maybe you've been going to church for years, months, days, or maybe it's your first time. The Bible says, today is the day of your salvation. If you're here today and you say, you know what, that's me, Pastor Paolo. I need to surrender my life to Christ. Jesus is calling me home and I need to give Him my life. Just lift up your hand if that's you. Just lift up your hand if that's you all across this room god bless you anybody else god bless you god bless you three four five god bless you six seven god bless you anybody else praise god wherever you're at even if you didn't raise your hand just pray this prayer with me say lord jesus i come to you in all humility Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for me and was raised on the third day. Today, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me from my sin. 
my sins and I receive the forgiveness and the life you're offering to me. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Lord, I pray for those who made that commitment today. I pray that you would seal that commitment. Thank you, God. Let's all stand as we end. Let me close in prayer before you go. Those of you who made a decision to commit your life to Christ today, please approach us after the service so that we can help and walk with you and find you someone you can journey with in this walk of faith. And let me pray for us here. Some of you are going through a, a, a quite a deep valley and there's fear. Fear paralyzes. But faith brings freedom. And so I want to pray for you today. Okay? There's some of you here, there's, you, you've been battling with fear. God doesn't want you to live in that zone. He wants to set you free. The angel of the Lord said, fear not. So I want to pray. The Lord will just set you free. Just bow your heads with me. If that's you today, I just want to pray. And I just want to believe God. I want to pray with you. And, and I go through fears the way you do. We all do. But we come to Him and we thank God because He has the ability to set us free. Replace fear with faith. Just lift up your hand if that's you. Lord, I pray for the men and the women that are lifting up their hands. Maybe those who are watching on live stream today. Father, in the name of Jesus, you've called us to walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes, Lord, what we see brings the fear. But Lord, we say, we set aside the fear and we look at you by faith. And we say, and we declare, because God is with me, Lord, I will never be shaken. And so Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would fill every person's heart right now with faith, with peace, with grace, knowing that you are for us and not against us. And Lord, even as we leave today, Lord, let your righteousness, peace, and joy go with us. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. Amen.